This unassuming gateway here in Oldham was once the only access to the vast railway network that made Platt Brothers the largest textile machine manufacturer in the world. Welcome back to part two of this in-depth look at the history of Platt Brothers. The year is 1842 and Hibbert Platt and Sons are now the largest employer in Oldham. John Platt, Henry's second son, marries Alice Radcliffe on the 9th of March at St James's Church, Grinnickers. Alice is the daughter of Samuel Radcliffe, to whom Henry sold his first cotton carding machine before he left Upper Mill. George Stevenson and his huge team of navvies have conquered the 1 in 27 gradient that is Werneth Incline, and the Middleton Junction and Oldham Branch Railway has opened on the 31st of March, making Werneth Oldham's first station. Plans are made to construct an entirely new works alongside the new railway. In 1843, restrictions on the exportation of machinery to foreign countries was abolished, and Hibbert, Platt and Sons are not slow in taking advantage. By 1844, Hartford New Works in Werneth begins production, just in time as foreign orders increased dramatically. Oldham's cotton machinery was of high and unequalled quality. According to Professor Douglas Farney of the University of Manchester, Platt mules were the basis of the industrial supremacy of Oldham, being unrivalled in length, in speed of operation and in productivity. In 1846, records show that jointly the two works had a combined cast iron usage of 5,000 tonnes and a combined coal usage of 10,000 tonnes annually. Hibbert, Platt and Sons now employed nearly 1,000 people. But this success was marred by two deaths. On the 16th of March 1845, at the age of 29, Joseph Platt, who finally succumbed to consumption. This disease causes a wasting of the body with the attack on the lungs. The lungs attempt to defend themselves by producing what are called tubercles. The tubercles become yellow and spongy and coughing fits cause the sufferer to spit them out. Its modern name, tuberculosis or TB, was the greatest killer in the industrial cities and killed one in seven of all people who lived there. A year later, Elijah Hibbert, who was 46, died in his residence at Leon House on the 10th of March, 1846. Both deaths showed the ongoing detrimental effects of living and working in the conditions produced by industrial towns of the area. Elijah Hibbert's contributions cannot be understated here. He was, after all, Oldham's most successful entrepreneur. His funeral procession comprised of over 300 workmen who held him in great esteem and 150 of the local populace, including clergymen and magistrates. A very relevant fact to this topic is that a year before his death, he became chairman of the Oldham District Railway Company which became part of the Lancaster and Yorkshire Railway and in 1847 they tunnelled from Werneth to connect the Grinnickers Moor site and with it Oldham Town Centre to the rest of the world.
James Platt, Henry's third son, took Joseph's place as business partner alongside his brother John. John was now a senior partner and entered negotiations with Elijah Hibbert's estate trustees regarding ownership of the company. The alliance came to fruition in 1854 when the brothers entered into partnership along with the firm's cashier and two department heads. By this time, the newly named Platt Brothers and Company had officially become the largest textile machine manufacturer in the world. Hartford New Works, seen here, was built parallel to the railway to take full advantage of the modern marvel. The new works were built with the railway in mind. Narrow gauge lines were even built inside the works as part of the mass production process. The frontage of the new works was here on Featherstall Road and followed the inclined railway on both sides as far down as the colliery at Stockfield. Every building had its own railway connection meaning that larger components and finished products could be transported between buildings by small shunting locomotives, a task that until now had been done by man and horsepower alone. The office and building entrance on Featherstall Road were designed by P. B. Alley in 1883. It has two long stories with arcades of round-headed windows and projecting pavilions at each end of the hipped roofs with brattishings. Brattishings are a decorative architectural repeat motif applied to the top of a wall or roof. The design often includes leaves and flowers and the term is particularly associated with Tudor architecture. Iron workers use brattishings to demonstrate their expertise in their work. The more ornate the design, the superior skill of the smithy. In the centre, a hipped roof clock tower and a good deal of fancy ironwork brattishings at the top. The following information is from a report from A. E. Wollstonecroft, who made large alterations to Hartford New Works in 1929. The works railway has grown from a simple siding and turntable connecting the old upper works to Werther station. At first, the Oldham terminus of the branch from Middleton Junction to the Manchester and Leeds railway. The foundations of this turntable were barred when the retaining wall at the south end of block eight were rebuilt. With the development of the works westward down the hillside the old sawmill, now block 14, by a line alongside the Middleton Junction line on the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway land. This was eventually extended to the forge and brickworks. At first this line connected to the works through the south end of the old sawmill to the old log yard and the middle yard as it is at present and to the foundry dressing shop and the two pig iron sidings next to the west side of the foundry. The new sawmill line was a later development about 1877. The first line crossing Gartwright Street is represented by the present crossing to the roller shop which connected to a small yard on the north side. This line was afterwards extended and used for the new sawmill but was found so inconvenient that the other, the present route was arranged. The faults with all these lines were the sharp and irregular curves about 40 to 50 feet radius. The laying out of which seems to have been left to the plate layers they cause endless trouble through buffers locking and the derailing of wagons, especially on the new sawmill line, 
with wagons laden with long logs and trees. After I laid the electric railway to predeterminate curves, I turned my attention to the railways and relayed all the troublesome curves to a minimum radius of 100 feet. To effect this in the top yard, the corner of block one had to be cut away. The curves in the middle yard between the smithy and the loom room were relayed as at present to the maximum radius possible. The main line to the sawmill was relayed with a minimum 200 feet radius for curves as recommended by the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway for the six wheel trucks that they largely use for long loads and other timbers. In the meantime I have extended the sawmill line along the front of the new case shop and by means of a turntable formed a siding along the east side of the reservoirs for standing deal wagons. Afterwards, when the new carriage shop was built, a connection was made to it across Arkwright Street from the smithy siding. The forge line has suffered little alteration except for the brickwork branch which has been shortened when Stockfield Road was formed, though the right to cross the road was retained. The main line, like the adjoining Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway, has a maximum gradient of 1 in 23, and this eventually led to an accident. Fortunately, there was no damage to life or limb. One of the old type Adamson engines Greenacres was taking down the usual morning train to the forge with the engine first according to rule when the brakes failed to hold and though the men stuck at their posts until the last moment the engine and train crashed through the top blocks and fell into Peel Street as shown on the photos the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway breakdown gang retrieved the engine and wagons which had sustained wonderfully little damage in fact the engine was soon running again after overhaul but the consequences were far reaching and costly first steam brakes were installed on all locos and then larger and more powerful ones bought a heavy brake van was bought from Lancashire and Yorkshire but these were small details for some time there had been a block of traffic at the Werneth Goodyard and sidings accommodation severely taxed. It was therefore decided to widen the Peel Street Bridge and acquire land below for the formation of a private siding. As those at Werneth Station allocated to us belonging to the L&Y. Some of the land was owned by the L&Y who cooperated by granting us the use of it. The rest was purchased. The bridge was widened by the L&Y Railway at our expense to a greater span to allow us future widening of Peel Street and the formation of an embankment for the sidings rapidly carried out. We then approached the L&Y to give us an outlet at the lower end to the Middleton Junction line which would have made an ideal arrangement and saved the heavy haulage of empties to burn the station. There was then a signal box nearby for the Stockfield colliery traffic, but the colliery was at the point of closing and the cost of a special signal box would have fallen on us as the distance was too great for a locked signal. The idea was therefore abandoned. But if it ever becomes practicable, these sidings would be very useful indeed, instead of only being used in an emergency. Later, at their own suggestion, another method to relieve the pressure at where the station was adopted, 
a crossover road was inserted by the Lancaster and Yorkshire, controlled by a lock signal opposite our wagon shed. Each day, a Lancaster and Yorkshire Railway goods engine calls at 4pm to take over the outgoing traffic. A man being sent down by the station master to work the signal. The L and Y also at first sent a shunting engine from the yard to assist our staff in holding the trains up the bank above the crossover switch. But lately the traffic has been so slight that this has not been needed. Just after the forge accident we had a similar mishap in the wagon shed and we at once obtained a set of hydraulic stopping blocks for this position and another at the end of the pig iron siding next to Arkwright Street, another danger spot. A. E. Wollstonecroft, 3rd of January 1929 The engine that fell off the bridge onto Peel Street was one of Daniel Adamson's who was an English engineer who successfully manufactured boilers and was the driving force behind the inception of the Manchester Ship Canal during the 1880s. Whereas the Werner site had to deal with steep hills and the many problems that entailed, the Grinnikus site had far more room to lay out its intricate rail network. The large Hartford goods sidings stretched from Grinnikus Moor and merged with the massive layout that was Royton Junction. Here the vast quantities of coal and iron could be stored alongside whatever raw materials were needed. These sidings were of course also used to provide Oldham's mills with raw cotton, coal and many other materials. Platt brothers had their own private owner's wagons and a fleet of 040 tank engines which kept the yard in order. But the amazing thing about all this is that everything that arrived by rail had to enter Grinnaker's works through this one gateway. Unlike Werneth, Grinnaker's was here before the railways, so the lines had to be worked around the current layout, which meant the original road access, meant for cart horses, had to be repurposed to accommodate a hundred tons of steam engine. These locomotives and wagons were all serviced by Platt's own maintenance teams of millwrights and joiners. By 1854 the Platt Brothers and Company Empire had expanded 
at a phenomenal rate. The workforce was approaching 3,000. Overseas visitors were left speechless by what they beheld. Nothing of this magnitude had ever been witnessed before. They were the largest cotton machine manufacturers in Lancashire and hence in the world. Dobson and Barlow in Bolton, once forerunners in this business, had been well and truly surpassed. The dynamic leadership of John Platt was destined to become legendary. Whilst making this video, something occurred at the present day location of Old Grinnaker's works that changed the landscape as it had done many times in the centuries before. One of the few surviving buildings that made up Hartford Old Works has burnt down, taking with it a tile and bathroom warehouse. Located here on Barry Street, this disaster that required over 50 firefighters to attend, leaves only two of the original works buildings remaining that haven't met a similar fate and been replaced with industrial units. Fires are an all too common problem for the mills and factories of Oldham and her neighboring towns. A matter that I will go into further detail about in a later video.